Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to this evening's webinar. Um, I hope that everybody can hear me clearly, and uh, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, but very briefly, my name is Dr. Simon Lack, and um, I'm going to be taking you through this evening's webinar. Uh, I had hoped to be joined by the rest of the team live, but um, unfortunately, we've had to do it in a in a uh, asynchronous fashion, in a non-live fashion. But um, we're still going to get. You'll be pleased to know um, you're not going to have to suffer my voice for the entirety of the 60 minutes. Um, we will be getting input from the rest of the team. Uh, so we're here to talk about knee and talk about knee pain, um, a topic that is dear to my heart. Um, and uh, everything you need to know about knee pain, it's probably a bit bold really as a statement, but we will be covering some ground this evening and I hope that you find that the ground that we do cover uh, is useful. Little um, outline of, of what I hope to bring this evening and take you through uh, a short welcome really and a little introduction to us as pure sports medicine um, then we will hear from each of the members of the team that are going to be involved in, in, in knee pain, knee rehab, knee assessment etc uh, if you were to attend a clinic at pure sports medicine um, explain a little bit about the common causes of knee pain now we could do a we could do a day's lecture I could probably do a weekend I could probably do more um, talking about common causes of knee pain so uh, it will be a fairly light touch but I do hope that it gives you some insight into into the way in which we think about this common um, problem I'd like you to I'd like to introduce you to some of our expert knee packages that we've we've pulled together briefly this evening and then go on to discuss some of the current scientific evidence that is helping us to help you. And we're going to be doing that through an example of, of a case study and use that to also um, demonstrate the way in which the multidisciplinary team may be involved in your care. Uh, the Of Mice and Men is, is because obviously the best laid plans of Mice and Men often go astray. This is the, this is the plan for this evening with some Q&A to follow, but um, uh, if it goes off and tangents, um, then I apologise in advance, but I, I hope to stick to both time and to, and to content. Uh, so a welcome, yeah, a welcome from us really, Pure Sports Medicine. Um, we know that good physical health and wellbeing are essential to your everyday life, which is why together uh, we want to ensure it's the best that it can possibly be. And, and the one thing that I hate to hear is that knee pain or knee injury has stood in the way of, of good physical health or, or your well-being. We, we believe that we have got a unique offering at Pure Sports Medicine and, and I've worked across a number of different sites um, within London as a physiotherapist over the years. And um, I believe wholeheartedly that this MDT offering that we have, this, these multiple professionals, so I say MDT, that's a multiple, multiple disciplinary team or multidisciplinary team uh, that we can bring a multi multitude of different perspectives to the problem and, and so often that really enables us to find a solution. The way in which we do that, the way in which we bring these services together is through communication which can sometimes be formally on letters and, and slightly more informally via email or even more informally so which is through corridor conversations and, and those can be extremely valuable uh, in helping us to, to help you. Uh, we believe a lot in teamwork. As I've mentioned, there are many members of the group of the professional network that we've got that um, can bring about the best possible solution. We've got one approach and we've got this broader support network, which is not only reliant upon colleagues that exist within pure sports medicine, but within a wider medical community. So we're going to just go through and introduce you to the team. This is the knee team, uh, a group of specialists who have got a particular interest in looking after individuals who have knee complaints. And um, because I'm the only one that's here live, I'm, I'm going to take privilege of going off first, just as a brief introduction. Uh, so I, I'm a physiotherapist and I graduated in 05, 2010, did my master's, 2017, finished my PhD where I spent five good years of my life exploring uh, the interaction of 
uh, the hip and foot biomechanics in people who have pain at the front of their knee in particular. So a small little sesamoid bone that sits at the front of your knee. That's why I spent five years studying. Um, but uh, I joke about it, but actually it was extremely um, interesting sort of period of, of my life and, and allowed me to really delve into the science. I now hold a senior lecturer role at um, Queen Mary University of London, and I lead the MSc programme there in sports and exercise medicine. I've been at Pure since 2012, and uh, I've now got a head of research role there, and um, also a specialist musculoskeletal physio role also. Uh, I hold some other posts where I'm head of medical services at the, or for the high performance program at the University of East London, which gives me um, a fantastic opportunity to see a large variety of uh, athletes really and, and patients uh, from a multitude of different sports, you know, whether that's weightlifting or uh, football or what else do we have? Hockey, uh, cricket, uh, volleyball, basketball, um, the lot. It's a really great spectrum of fantastic young athletes. Um, we're excitedly launching a new uh, program, which is the first ever professional wheelchair basketball, female wheelchair basketball team named East London Phoenix, um, and they'll be starting with us very soon. And then I'm also head of medical for the professional basketball team, the London Lions. So, uh, so my experience is quite broad, and, and hopefully I'll bring that into clinical practice on a daily basis in order to, again, help you. Next, uh, we come to our consultant in sports and exercise medicine, um, Dr. James Noken. Who better to introduce Dr. James Noken than, than James himself? So uh, this is where I hope that the technology works and we'll pass over to that. So I'm James Noken. I'm a consultant in sports and exercise medicine. Um, and I've been working at Pure Sports Medicine for seven or eight years now. Um, some people are quite confused about what a sports and exercise medicine uh, doctor does I and mean, I think essentially in a nutshell we are experts or specialists in the diagnosis assessment and management of non-surgical um, musculoskeletal injuries and conditions which might be sports related uh, or not and musculoskeletal essentially means injuries related to bone muscle uh, joints tendons essentially um, and sports and exercise medicine doctors come from what a various sort of diverse background and we have um, portfolio careers working in different areas um, of sports medicine so that might be within the NHS um, in the private sector um, which is where I'm located at Pure um, working in academics uh, academic positions uh, for medical officer roles in governing bodies as team doctors uh, and as event, event physicians as well essentially my background, again, like I said earlier, is quite diverse. So I came from an orthopedic background. So I did all my orthopedic surgical training, which gave me a very nice background in terms of and the anatomy and understanding of sports injuries historically. Um, and then I realized I didn't enjoy the surgical side of things that much. So I moved into the, you know, the physician aspect of things um, and interacting with patients and communicating, understanding their injuries better, essentially, rather than being. Uh, as an operating table one <laughs> day. Um, and that led me through into medicine, rheumatology, uh, where we get a, a completely different overview of joints related issues, which is all very relevant to, to, to musculoskeletal medicine. Um, and then on, whilst doing that, moving through working with, in, uh, in elite sports, working in various different sporting disciplines, for me specifically rugby, um, gymnastics and athletics, um, disability football, Etc. Etc. So taking experience from different areas, sporting areas, through my training time, um, and that allows me to bring back the principles of elite sports management and rehabilitation back to the, to the general population, patients at Pure Sports Medicine Centre. Lovely. Thank you. Uh, so that was a bit about James, and then on to another member of our team, um, someone else who would be involved if you were to uh, come in and seek care for. Uh, your knee pain or may well be involved uh, should we deem it appropriate or, or necessary and and that's uh, Joanna who's our Pilates instructor so again um, a little word from Joanna. Hello everyone my name is Joanna Lamos also known as Jo and I'm a Pilates instructor at Bank. My background is in dance and I was introduced to Pilates type exercises at a very young age as part of my uh, training to help improve control. 
my formal Pilates training was with Alan Herdman, who was the first to bring Pilates to the UK in 1969, well before it became a buzzword in the fitness industry. Alan always emphasized the importance to treat the individual patient and not just go through a set of exercises. He always said, ask yourself, why are you prescribing a certain exercise? Should you modify it and how? He also encouraged us to try other methods of movement um, and to work with many instructors. I always use the Pilates principles in my work, but I also use a lot of elements from the Franklin method, move training, and endless hours of fun experimentation in the studio. So then carrying on through the team, um, next we've got Ian, who is our sports podiatrist. Uh, and uh, he unfortunately had a had a clash of diaries as he alluded to in just a minute. So uh, over to over to Ian. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, really sorry, I've had to pre-record this, and I can't be there live. I've just had a bit of a clash of evening uh, online activities, as as is as is the way nowadays. Um, just to briefly introduce myself, my name is Ian. Um, I am one of the podiatrists at Pure Sports Medicine. I, I work uh, out of the Canary Wharf Clinic and out of the Bank Thread Needle Street Clinic. I've worked um, at Pure Sports Medicine for just over 10 years now. And I hold clinics there alongside uh, my responsibilities, looking after some uh, professional sports men and women of various uh, teams and sports, and also alongside some academic duties and some lecturing that, that I tend to do as well. Uh, my entire professional life has been dedicated to the, the study and the understanding of the human foot and notably uh, trying to get a great grip on uh, what it does, how it behaves, how it interacts with the environment and what this may mean in the context of a given individual or a given problem uh, context here this evening, of course, being, being knee pain. Um, from a research study uh, interest point of view, um, we often refer to the what we call the foot level environment, which is anything that we put around the foot. So that can include the footwear, plus or minus something we, we may put inside the footwear, some kind of insert. And we're most interested in trying to identify what, what foot level environment may be best for what individual for what given problem. Uh, so in individuals with, with knee pain, do we think intervening down at foot level is going to be of benefit to them. And of course, for some it will and for some it won't. And, and the challenge is trying to identify um, who fits into what camp. So even though I'm the, the as, a, as a people referring to the foot guy, it's interesting that I would say approaching 50% of my clinical lists um, are probably knee pain. Predominantly runners, but but um, other sports as well. But I see I see probably as much knee pain as I do foot pain. But I'm working alongside my colleagues, uh, the, the doctors, the physiotherapists, the strength and conditioning coaches, just to give that viewpoint of whether the foot and its behaviour is a is a key factor in in um, in a particular individual. And I think that's what's so exciting for me, at least, about this this knee package uh, initiative. Well, and, and uh, last but by no means least is, is Dean, Dean Sutton, who's our strength and conditioning coach here, um, and a little intro from, from Dean. Hi there, my name is uh, Dean Sutton, I'm the strength and conditioning coach at Pure Sports Medicine at Bank. Uh, my background is predominantly in team sports, working in rugby with uh, London Scottish, and then moved on to um, individual sports, I'm working with the LTA at Bishop Abbey um, within tennis. So I hope that, that that gives you all just a bit of a flavour of, of who we are as a team, as a collective. Although I'm the one here sort of doing most of the talking tonight, I, I wanted to really uh, stress that this is a team effort. Whenever we're managing individuals with knee complaints, it has to come from a multidisciplinary group. Uh, because that's that's really what um, is going to help you to get get better. So we're now going to move on to the the next phase really of, of this evening's talk, which is dealing with what are some of the common causes of knee pain. Now, for the sake of this evening and 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 really not just for the sake of this evening, actually, just to better sort of try and encapsulate what we see at Pure and what are the typical reasons for why an individual may present with knee complaints. Uh, 
we tend to divide this up into three broad categories. And that is that of trauma, insidious or pathological. But the reality is, is that um, whilst pathological knee complaints do exist, um, they are infrequent, they are less common. And so tonight we're going to um, go on and really talk about that of trauma and insidious onset knee pain. But, but just to touch upon this aspect of pathological knee pain, that, that's if you've uh, got a, an underlying um, systemic issue in the form of uh, rheumatoid arthritis that then is manifesting itself in a, um, in a knee complaint or uh, possibly a, a malignancy or a cancer that can bring about some knee pain. But I, I do briefly touch on that because the reality is, is that that is, that is, or that does represent the very small minority of knee complaints that do present to clinic. So trauma first. When we talk about trauma, obviously we're talking about a one-off acute event at which point um, the knee has, has really suffered as a result of, of the mechanism of injury. What is so common when we talk about trauma really is that we have this mechanism of injury and, and it's really on us as clinicians to, to quiz you as, as patients to, to find out what it was that brought about those symptoms. That mechanism, how it has come about in the first place becomes the most critical clue in helping to understand what is going on in and around the knee. It's typical or far more typical that with trauma it comes about an acute injury to some of the ligaments in and around the knee, uh, most commonly reported that of the anterior cruciate ligament, and posterior cruciate ligament much less frequently, or those ligaments that sit just there on the inside of the knee, um, and uh, those are your medial collateral ligaments or your lateral co collateral ligaments. Obviously, fractures do occur in and around the knee, and you can have acute muscle injuries and, um, uh, and tendon injuries also. But with trauma, the symptom, whilst it is painful, and obviously pain is often associated with that trauma, in some instances, the pain actually doesn't represent the most significant factor, the most, uh, most sort of commonly reported complaint or disability that's associated with that injury. Quite commonly, it's instability or it's giving way, that sensation of, of the knee buckling from underneath as you're doing an innocuous task after having previously sustained an injury. Some may report locking or catching or swelling. Now, it may be that the management becomes quite similar to that which we're going to describe with an insidious onset knee pain. But sometimes what we need to consider with this particular patient group is uh, that surgery may be indicated and may be the right route to go down. And that's when we're drawn, as we mentioned earlier, that much wider uh, group of professionals that we're involved in at Pure Sports Medicine, which is the, um, uh, which is the orthopedic surgeons. The second type of knee pain really is that of an insidious onset. Now, insidious onset knee pain um, is just that. It's, it's something that comes on gradually over the course of time. Now, this is where it, there often isn't that single mechanism of injury. It's not, oh, I did this and I got that pain. It's something that, oh, actually, I've noticed this coming on and it's been progressively getting worse and worse. This is where, from a history perspective, us, us listening to you and, and hearing your story is paramount. It sits above all else. And so um, what we are listening for, so when we listen to the story and then we go on and do our physical examination, is to understand which of these domains, as, we've, as, we've, as I've sort of highlighted here, which of those are contributing to your symptoms. So, for some, it's about how they're built. So there's an aspect of the way in which they were anatomically put together, which then means with a certain activity that they've been doing over time, that structure has brought about an overload to some tissue in a resultant symptom. For others, it's a bit about how they move, about how they're built. And this is something we, we bracket up in term biomechanics. And that refers to aspects of an individual's strength or movement pattern. 
For others, it, it's a bit of a training error, really. It's a volume, frequency or an intensity issue. They've done a bit too much too soon. And it's that that has taken their tissue out of its uh, zone of, of homeostasis where that tissue is healthy. And it breaks it down and, and, and subsequently results in um, nociception within the tissue. Now, nociception is a medical term, but it's effectively it's a firing off of signal, the electrical signal that comes from the tissue. So whenever we talk about structure, biomechanics, volume, frequency, intensity, all of those things can drive this nociceptive process. And it's only once it passes that those signals pass through our central nervous system, through our, our psychology, through our psychosocial uh, aspects, that it would ever be reported as pain. And, and so whilst the evidence would suggest that from a, when we look at this psychosocial domain that, um, that there are particular um, uh, psychological elements that result in symptoms, it definitely acts as a filter and a volume switch that sits between what's on the left-hand side of your screen there, these, these entities that can drive a neural process there's a volume switch that sits between it and then the expression of pain. And whether we're in a, in a psychological state in order to be able to handle those signals that are coming from the tissue and a really robust and rigorous place, or we're not, may well act as the determinant as to whether you're there with a seven, eight, nine, ten 10 out of 10 pain or a two, three, four out of 10 pain. And so, the insidious onset knee pain is a challenging entity. It's quite an exciting entity. Um, and I don't mean that in a, in, a, um, in a sort of slightly odd way. I'm meaning that in a, it's a, it's a challenging entity for us as clinicians uh, because, because this really represents an important time where we need to get to know you and, and better understand what it is that has brought about that, um, brought about that symptom onset. And that's what makes it exciting. The final point, and whenever we talk about pain, like the minute we start talking about pain, the reality is, is that we're starting to, to delve into some of the complexities of, of the human being. And an individual's perception of pain is absolutely unique to them. And it's influenced, as I've just alluded to, by a number of factors and a number of experiences and a lot of what has come before and, and what is going to happen in the future. And our ability as clinicians to understand that, understand what's relevant to you, actually, and quite often, represents some of the most important factors that will help us or enable us to help you the best uh, and in the best possible way. I hope that that's made some sense. I, I'm, I'm challenged by some of the complexity around pain and, and that interaction. Uh, but actually, that's a, the way in which I hope that we can boil it down so it makes some sense as to what we're dealing with. So whether we've got this insidious onset or this traumatic onset or even a pathological onset of, of symptoms, what we do offer and what we have got at Pure are um, some packages of care which are designed to really help and be directed towards you as the individual and that we've spent some time uh, tweaking and making sure that they are, um, that they sit across the breadth of what hopefully you would like um, and um, uh, will help to get you better. Uh, first program really centers around an individual who, who wants to self-manage, somebody who's um, really quite keen on, on sorting themselves out, but just needs that little bit of steer Program two, somebody who's looking for a solution right now. Program three, an expert management plan is what's needed. Or program four, where you've got the slightly more complex knee problem and, and we're really needing to elicit the help of the entire multidisciplinary team. So to just walk through these quite briefly, um, want to self-manage, this is a one-off session with uh, one of the expert knee physiotherapists that we have at Pure, which is appropriate if you're experiencing a new case of knee pain. Um, and uh, what you get from that is a diagnosis or um, an onward suggestion if we're unable to arrive at a diagnosis. But the expectation would be that we would be able to get to a diagnosis at that point. Advice on the condition, appropriate management, 
and then plus some educational content for you to be implementing and moving forwards with. Second program sits around and needing a solution now, and this is a series of three sessions of uh, input from the physio, which is designed um, for you if you're experiencing a new case of, of knee pain. Again, we're looking to arrive at this diagnosis and implement a management plan. The third package is, um, is for those slightly more complex or those who are really wanting to um, get to the bottom of a problem that has persisted just for that little bit longer still. Here we'd be looking to bring in not only the physiotherapist, but also the strength and conditioning coaches uh, in order to take you from an early progression with rehab and into that, that end stage um, uh, management into the longer term. The final is, is this for a more complex um, knee problem. And here we'd be eliciting input from not only the consultant, but the physio and the podiatrists and linking that in from a diagnostic and treatment perspective and looking at this management plan and um, also uh, bringing in either the, uh, the um, Pilates instructor, sorry, like Joe or, or Dean um, from a strength and conditioning side. So those, those are packages that we've put together. They're open to individuals who are on insurance or um, self-paying, but it's just to make you aware that we've, the, there's this sort of tiered process. And hopefully there's, if you are in need of uh, physio input or you're in need of input because of a knee complaint, then, then hopefully one of those um, would appeal to you and, and will deliver what it is that you want from your care. So I, I wanted to sort of take that concept of there are some packages or there's a ways in which we can manage particular problems and, and move that forwards into a case scenario now, which is um, where we're going to look at a 35 year old um, athlete who or recreational athlete who played some basketball and sustained an ACL injury. I want to sort of take you through a bit of the journey, but also look at the way or listen to or hear from each of the members of the team as to how they may consider this type of injury, how they might be involved and um, what interventions they might start to think about putting in place as, we, as, as this individual goes through their journey of care uh, with us at Pure Sports Medicine. So, um, because they've obtained this acute injury, so this sudden onset injury, they've, they've sought out a treat, a, um, uh, an appointment with us at Pure, and, and this is our bank clinic that you're seeing here. So they've come in and um, with that appointment booked. And at the initial consultation, what we would be looking to obtain from all individuals who are seeking this input are some baseline measures. So we're not just taking these measures um, just for good practice and to publish papers or something along those lines. These are genuinely there to help us to better understand your problem or in this scenario, uh, this individual's problem, what it's meaning that they're unable to do as a result of their pain complaint and also gives us insight into ways in which we can start to help. Uh, as we've touched on, or as I just touched on earlier, there are many domains that uh, can explain why an individual might experience symptoms and those domains uh, need to be understood and some of these questionnaires give us some insight into which of those domains are the most relevant for that individual. At that, one of the early appointments and possibly the initial appointment would then be with the sports doc. So we're going to now hear from James as to what his thoughts might be around how he would approach um, somebody who's presenting, such as this 35-year-old who's presenting with an acute knee injury. Hi again, James. Um, so uh, we'd really love to just sort of hear your thoughts now as to what um, or how you might go about approaching, uh, looking at, assessing and, and planning the management of this individual, this 35-year-old this individual who's presented with an acute knee injury, which we suspect may be an ACL. Um, yes, thank you. I think um, I'd rewind that a little bit and say perhaps that you know, I might see a, an ACL, a crucial ligament injury at different stages potentially. So yes, in the team doctor role or you know, in the clinic occasionally I might see a, a patient come in uh, or a patient sustain a very fresh acute traumatic knee injury, um, which could be, you know, uh, you know, which there could be varying diagnoses and which we need to investigate first. Um, 
or I might see a patient a little bit further down the line, for example, a patient who's been abroad skiing and has been in a resort for a couple of weeks and a brace has been managed there. So they come to see me maybe four, six, eight weeks down the line. And also there's potential that a patient might have been managed by another doctor or clinician or physiotherapist with a, uh, a grumbling ligament injury uh, and failing to progress or that injury had been got, gone undiagnosed. So a couple of months down the line, or even maybe a year or so, sometimes I see patients with a, a, an undiagnosed or undefined crucial ligament injury um, who are failing to, to make progress and recover essentially. In terms of a, a fresh traumatic, what we call an acute ACL injury, um, you know, a patient might, you know, it, it's important to make a, you know, make a further assessment in clinic. So these patients are going to be in quite a lot of pain. They're going to be sometimes have difficulty weight bearing, limping, um, a swollen, painful knee. Occasionally, patients don't come in anywhere near as sore as that, so it can be quite subtle uh, the fresh ACL injury. So it varies from pa patient to patient, really, the presentation. Um, the history, so taking the story and effect, an accurate history and a story is really important. So the mechanism of injury is is actually very crucial. So we listen closely to how that patient has injured that knee. Um, you know, were they, for example, if they were skiing, was the knee fixed in the bindings? Was their knee rotated? Um, you know, which way did the knee go? Did they recall a pop or a snap? That's not always the case, but that's often recounted. Was there rapid onset swelling, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Um, so those mechanisms can almost tell you straight away what type of injury we're looking for or suspecting, which then leads to the examination, which is also, also very important. So we're looking at the knee and detail in clinic. So can the patient's weight bear? Can they squat? Can they single leg squat? Does the knee have stability? Um, is the knee swollen, obviously? Um, is the knee stable when we test the ligaments, the ligament integrity? So we can do special tests on the bed, which allow us to understand which ligaments may or may not have been affected. Another test to look for additional injuries. So crucial ligaments injuries don't always happen in isolation. Sometimes they can be it can be multi-injuries, for example, injuries to the cartilage uh, or the external ligaments. And it's important not to miss those as well. But when an ACL, when a, when a knee injury is fresh and traumatic and new, things are painful, muscle, there's a lot of muscle spasm. It can be sometimes quite hard to fully assess accurately a, 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 a knee and make a hard diagnosis about which specific structures or ligaments have been injured. Um, uh, and most it's important, obviously, not to cause pain to the patient when we're examining them. So that's when potentially early diagnostic tests become even more important. So we need to understand what, is, what has happened inside the knee. Now, in clinic, I might do an ultrasound scan. So an ultrasound scan can lend us extra information it can tell us about, in particular, the ligaments on the outside, on the outside of the knee. Um, and we can assess the integrity of those in clinic, especially doing a dynamic stress test using ultrasound to see if they're intact. But that can't tell us everything about what's going on inside the knee. Um, so that's when we would consider an early MRI scan, which gives us beautiful pictures of the inside of the knee, the cartilage, the ligaments, etc. Um, so we have, a, a, you know, if I suspected an, an ACL injury in a patient who walked in or limped into clinic, then potentially I would, I would, I would have a low threshold for getting an MRI scan to assess that so we can make some accurate decisions about uh, the treatment plan going forward from there. So James has just alluded to the involvement of the MRI scan and, and where that might fit. And, and absolutely for some individuals, this is a really important investigation for us to go through. And um, what we'd be looking for there is, is uh, in this scenario anyway, looking for the integrity of that ligament, but also looking for other reasons as to why uh, the, the um, person is complaining of the complaints that they're complaining of or uh, if there's other, other sort of um, injuries that have been sustained within the knee at the same time. Uh, we sometimes use Im imaging in non-traumatic injuries as well. And that again can help us with a diagnosis. One of the biggest dichotomies we've got in medicine, one of the biggest challenges that we've got in medicine is that we can do this fantastic detailed imaging and it can find a heck of a lot of fault uh, in people's knees. But actually the correlation, the association with, with that uh, particular tissue injury and the symptoms that individuals are experiencing don't often add up. 
and whilst so therefore whilst imaging is really helpful it isn't the be all and end all and it certainly doesn't give us all of the information that we need it is it is a piece of the puzzle the diagnostic puzzle and in particular that sinks sits true with um, those insidious type onset uh, knee symptoms that I was talking about earlier. For this individual, they did um, exactly what they needed to do in these early stages. Uh, they were they rested the knee appropriately and they um, did the appropriate early management. What they're then faced with is a decision, particularly in this instance where they've had a traumatic knee injury. And that decision really sits around, uh, do you go and operate on this knee or do you not go and operate on this knee? Or maybe I do, but maybe not now and I do it a bit later. Now this decision-making process is, in, is one of the many processes that, are, uh, that we use the evidence to support. So the scientific evidence in order to support and, and bring that information back to uh, the patient in front of us to help them to make the decision that is right for them. And so uh, when we look into the literature around the ACL as just an example, and um, what we've got is we've got some fantastic work that's out there in the scientific community, and it really challenges some of our assumptions at times. And um, so not going back all that far or that long ago, um, it would have been a commonly held belief that actually for all injuries, all ACL ruptured injuries, what we needed to do was to operate and repair that ligament. And actually what this most recent study, this was a 2020, 21 study, um, what they've looked at is what is the comparability between those who have surgery early, so um, within the first few weeks um, after the injury and up to three months, or those who didn't have surgery within that three month window and delayed it, or didn't even have surgery at all. And some of the interesting findings around that was that we had 50% of the group who did not uh, have surgery immediately, 50% went on and, and did not need surgery at all to have a comparable level of function to those who had had surgery in that early window. Now, whilst there are still obviously 50% of that group that then did go on and need surgery or, or had instability that meant that they needed to go on to surgery, there was a good proportion who did not. And so for them, the surgery would have been both costly and timely and, and seen them out of action for a long period of time. So for some, it's the right thing. It's the right thing to do to make that early decision and to get on and have that surgical intervention. For others, it is not. And, and what we're trying to do here or what we aim to do with all individuals is to take the time to talk through what the options are and come up with the right one that's right for them or for you. The other reason it's, it becomes that much more challenging still is because there are secondary complications. So whilst surgery may be seen in this instance as a, as a good thing to do, um, it's, not without, uh, uh, it's not without consequence. And sometimes what we see is that actually um, arthritic change within the joint may well come on earlier or may be more pronounced in those who do have surgery. Now, I don't want to paint a massively anti-surgery picture that's not what I'm aiming to do here at all. What I'm aiming to present is the fact that there is, a, there is a balanced argument to be made and that sometimes those commonly held beliefs that this is the one thing that needs to be done for a particular diagnosis or a particular condition, actually um, there's, there's a balance to be struck between, um, between that or, or to inform that decision. We're now going to go on and just explore a little bit more about how we might think about our management approach. And here again, I'm going to drop back into um, having a chat with James uh, that I did this morning and um, listen to his perspective of how we might go about managing it before then I take you through um, what the rest of the team would do or how they might uh, look to manage this individual. So, yeah, so it's the next thing that we come on to is, is giving some thought as to how we might manage and, and start to plan the management of this particular individual, but, but in the broader sense, you know, how do we go about as a team starting to think about the way in which we are going to manage individuals as a collective and who's the most appropriate person to get involved um, yeah. in their care? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think if we 
if we've been at the point where we suspect an ACL tear of pressure, maybe we've got an MRI scan which confirms that rupture, but in isolation, so it's an isolated ACL injury, um, one that potentially doesn't need any surgical intervention or opinion early, which is which is the case in some circumstances. I would say my role continues there to a degree in the sense of giving that patient's pain under control, and that might involve simple over-the-counter medications or prescription medications. Is there potentially a role for a brace in some patients? That's not always the case. Very occasionally, it can be helpful to, if the knee is very swollen and tense, and the patient isn't able to move their knee in any reasonable way, we'll get the muscles firing, sometimes taking the fluid out of the knee can be a helpful option at an early stage, but it's not a typical, typical approach, but it's one of the options we can think about. But the idea is to get the knee quiet early, that's an early stage. So get the knee under control, get the symptoms down, get the like, symptoms less irritable, get the swelling down, so we can start to move through a, um, an early rehabilitation approach. And the, for me, the next step would be um, to liaise closely with a physiotherapist like yourself, who has expertise in ACL and rehabilitation. So we move into an early, early rehab phase where we can start to start to gain some range of movement, um, add some muscle exercises to, to prevent further muscle wasting, try and recreate um, normal function without overloading the knee and, and making it more irritable, essentially. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important early phase, but it's a delicate one, and ACO is seen by a you know, very experienced ACL um, um, physiotherapist I do. Yeah, and it, I think one of the nicest things that we've got at Pure and the way in which these conversations unfold is that actually, you know, often I'm just next door or or down the corridor, such a so, so that sort of it, it becomes a conversation about how is the best way that we proceed with management, and, and then when do we start to, or, or um, who do we start to bring in in terms of that wider MDT in order to optimally manage this individual. So, and, and we'll go into a bit more of that um, a bit later on in the, this evening. Yeah, exactly. So then, as James has alluded to, then it hands down the down the line and, and may end up at my door and looking towards uh, rehabilitation. Now, I know we're talking very much here around an ACL injury, but the, the concepts that, that I'm trying to get across here are broader than that. There's this there's this aspect around diagnosis that may be informed by some imaging. There's this consideration around what interventions early are needing to be done in order to maybe modify pain, reduce swelling. Um, improve early function and sometimes that's where um, James and, and some of the other team members um, may come in in order to give you that early degree of relief and, and early symptom um, modification. In order to take this forward then uh, the other aspects of what I then do is, is look at taking measurement in order to understand where deficits sit. So what is it that you're unable to do or what is it that your muscles are unable to do or where is it that you're stiff and by how much are you stiff because these numbers actually um, enable us to do two things really it's, it enables us to feed back to you when uh, something's gone really well and when you're actually looking to progress and so we can quantify some of that progress um, but it also uh, provides a feedback loop for me that what I've given you to do is actually having the effect on something that we want it to have an effect on. Looking at the bottom left here, which is a handheld dynamometer, that's something that can tell us about how strong you are. And then I may put in an intervention plan that aims to affect your strength. Well, I want to then go back and be able to evaluate whether I've had a positive effect upon your strength or not. And that provides a means in which to do that. How we then go about structuring some sort of management plan? Well, this would vary dependent on who you are and what it is that you want to achieve and how much time realistically um, you have in your day, in your week, in order to be able to focus in on, on doing um, something that's going to help you to get better. So we'd structure that through the week. We may outline what it is in terms of how long it's going to take realistically and what through what sort of periodization approach would we need to take? The exercise program then uh, would be progressive in nature and we'd be looking towards some early activation of muscles perhaps and then taking up into standing and then starting to add some load. Uh, touched on a, a key term here which is about progression 
what's absolutely critical with any rehab program, with any physiotherapy intervention, is that you identify what it is that the individual is able to do at baseline and or at the start of their treatment, and that we map out a means in which to make that progressive over the course of time. Without progression, we're not going to get adaptation. Without adaptation, we're not going to get progression. We then, uh, or at an appropriate time, or if it's indicated early, um, bring in the podiatrist, bring in Ian, and look at using him uh, to understand whether an intervention at a foot level is going to be helpful in the management of your case. And, and this uh, can be done through a gait assessment. Uh, here's, here's Ian now just taking you through uh, some of his thought processes in, in relation to this ACL, but, but also just more generally as to how he goes about approaching or thinking about his management approach for an individual who is presenting with knee complaints. So I think the, the really interesting thing here with a specific case such as a non-operative ACL management and podiatry or foot level sort of opinion is we've got to try and identify uh, those individuals or a given individual that, that may respond well and, and benefit to something at foot level and someone who may not. And it is certainly not the case that everyone will. Uh, to, to bore you a little bit with um, uh, a sort of look into the literature for some insight, um, it doesn't feel hugely helpful because it seems to contradict itself. And what I mean by that is we, I could easily put up a paper for you that showed you that putting inserts in people's shoes dramatically changed the mechanics and the loading patterns of their knee and as such uh, improved their symptoms. Um, I could also find papers that show there was no dramatic change uh, at, at knee level with regard to mechanics and symptoms. And there's even a paper that, that looked at collegiate basketball players in the US um, and it showed or it concluded that foot orthoses, so the inserts we put in people's shoes, were actually pre preventative of certain uh, ligamentous damage at the knee, including the ACL. So what do we do with all that information? Well, what I think it, it, it is a narrative on or what it speaks to is just how individual the responses to these interventions can be. There's never going to be a, a blanket approach to every ACL needs X, Y or Z. So to give an idea of just some of the things that we might do in clinic to identify whether this individual in front of us may be a good candidate for podiatry intervention or care, um, are often a series of what we would refer to as treatment direction tests, which uh, is ultimately a, not a podiatry term, it's more, more of a physiotherapy term. But what we can do is we can um, ask the individual, uh, in this case, the, the person with the, the, the ACL that hasn't been operated on, uh, what specific tasks are provocative? So what, what things do you do that, that provide uh, discomfort or, or you know, irritate your symptoms? And it may be something like uh, ascending stairs or uh, doing, a, doing a squat um, or, or something similar. And then what we can do is ask them to perform those tasks both without and with a certain intervention at foot level and see if their symptoms immediately change. So we can ask them to perform a single leg squat, ask them how uncomfortable it was or how unstable they felt, perhaps uh, ask them to perform this again in a certain shoe or perform this on, on top of a foot orthosis, a certain in-shoe device. And if they immediately feel less comfort or less stable, the research tells us that, uh, that they are, it is suggested they are more likely to do well with something at foot level. And that doesn't necessarily mean that will be a life sentence, but something to complement their ongoing physiotherapy, strength conditioning, etc. Equally, we could tape up the feet uh, and send them away for two or three days. Uh, and ultimately, we're asking their feet to do something uh, different uh, for those couple of days. And then they can report back to us if, whilst their foot was being asked to do something different, their experience of knee level symptoms or stability felt dramatically improved or not. And these are the kind of things that give us clues as to whether someone with a, with a, with a knee um, injury or knee sensitivity may do well with us intervening um, at foot level from a podiatry perspective. But I should, I should make absolutely clear, and I want it to be, to be sort of uh, well known that um, not everyone with a knee problem will, uh, if, they come to see, uh, if they come to see the podiatrist, will end up needing something inside their shoe. That's a discussion to be had on an individual basis. And um, of those who do, uh, I certainly wouldn't want them to necessarily visualise it as, as a life sentence, just something that can help complement 
uh, the other management strategies. It's very much a very much a team approach, um, as, as I'm certain the other speakers have already alluded to. So once we've given some consideration to, to foot level intervention, we've, we've given some consideration to this diagnosis and these early management plans, what we then start to transition or segue our, ourselves towards is that you've, you've received some early intervention, we've got some progress in pain, we're starting to see some improvements in function, and actually what we're now then looking to do is, is build upon that with potentially enlisting the help of of either Dean or Joe um, to, to build a, a rehab program that not only sees you through those early stages, but into those latter stages. And actually, even having said that, they've, they've still got a role in the early stages, perhaps not so much around managing the acute injury, but um, with a slightly more sort of holistic hat on um, and giving some consideration to what the role is for exercise interventions or, or, re, or, or strength and conditioning based exercise interventions um, that can help you uh, as an individual whilst you're going through this process of um, rehabilitation. So um, here's Dean very briefly just sort of touching on, on his philosophies and thoughts around how he might get involved in, in this scenario. With regards to any non-operative patients, um, again, it's quite crucial that we uh, get in quite early uh, just to make sure that we can implement that um, upper body strength plan whilst the um, physiotherapist is working with your lower body rehab. Um, and then over time, um, once you finish with the physiotherapist, we can recommend about giving you ongoing strength and conditioning plans that is going to help both for strength, for your balance and for your range of motion. And the thing that he, he actually talks quite eloquently about but hasn't really mentioned it in that video is that he, he talks about the sort of the mental well-being. So, so often when individuals are injured, actually that, that loss of uh, ability to exercise well, that loss of identity that comes with not being able to exercise um, means that he starts scratching his head and starting to think about oh, what, what are the ways in which he could fill that void. And uh, so often I've heard him sort of talk about bringing in a particular program that um, is, is pretty much centered around just keeping the athlete, the individual, um, the, the sort of um, the person in a state where they're just, they're just feeling good about themselves. They're able to do some exercise and it's having a, a more global effect and a positive impact upon their symptoms. He's touched on also a pre and a post um, surgery aspects of where he might get involved. And for some individuals with this, with this particular injury, with this ACL injury, as I mentioned, it may be appropriate that they do go through for a surgical consult and surgical in intervention, uh, even if there are a group that, that actually don't need that. Well, I feel the strength and conditioning coach should be involved as early as possible, even before the operation. All the research suggests that the stronger and fitter you are, um, before you go into your operation, um, then the better outcomes. Uh, and then post-operation, um, I can work alongside the uh, physiotherapist to work on upper body strength and conditioning, um, looking at off-feet conditioning, um, just to keep the patient engaged through the rigors of their first stage of the um, rehabilitation phase. And then once we come to the late stage, um, I can certainly work on um, multi-directional drills, running drills, um, if you're in a particular sport, um, sport specific drills to get you back onto the pitch. And so, so this is where we start to see this transition across from, from physio, from rehab and into, into more of those strength and conditioning domains when we're looking at that end stage and, and performance based metrics. A lot of this is a holistic approach to movement. So even though we are looking at the knee injury scenario today, that does not mean I wouldn't be looking at the rest of the body. To answer the question, at what stage of the rehab process can one engage in Pilates? My answer is simply as soon as possible, as long as you've cleared it with a uh, sports doctor and physio. An injury affects us in many ways. Pain and inability to carry on with our favorite activities is the obvious one. But alongside that come a whole host of emotions and usually a step back from activity altogether, leading to general deconditioning. 
Pilates is hugely adaptable, so it is extremely rare that we can't do anything at all. And I always find that moving improves one's outlook. So where do I stop? Assuming I can't go near the knee yet because of pain or swelling, my top priority is to find movement that is not provocative and ideally enjoyable so that we don't stop moving completely. I then want to look a bit more into the why. How did the injury occur? Could it have been prevented? Who is not pulling their weight here? Are the hips and ankles moving well? Or are they restricted and imposing rotational forces to the knee? What are the effects of lifestyle and habitual movement preferences? Do we always move forwards? How often do we move sideways? How often do we rotate? And where is the rotation happening from? Do we have control where and when we need it? I take an inside out approach, my goal being to use all the tools available to me for maximum effectiveness and efficiency. Here's what we have at our disposal, the skeleton, the deep muscles whose primary function is to stabilize, working at a low intensity for long periods of time. More superficial muscles responsible for our bigger movements, they tend to work harder in it, but for shorter periods of time. And then we have our myofascial slings, which I like to visualize as a set of therabands inside the body. Our bodies are very clever and can usually find a way around, you know, catch it so they will all of it get things done. It might always be the most efficient way, and that might go unnoticed until one day the knee says, stop, I've had enough of this. You must then grab this opportunity. Use it to learn about yourself and the way you move. Taking the time to do this will stay with you forever. Ultimately, my goal is to increase your awareness so you know when and how to regress or progress to keep you out of trouble. I'm using the term regress here with caution because I certainly don't want, to, want it to sound like a setback. Consider it more like listening to what your body is telling you on any given day and finding an appropriate response. And yes, a few extra pairs of eyes are good, but they're not always available on a daily basis. As your knee settles and the foundation is set, we can then build on it. You will have learned to scan your body, to become aware of natural bone rhythm, and, acti and activate the inner unit of, for optimal stability. With improved tolerance, you will engage your prime movers and challenge yourself in space, waking up your myofascial slings. Finally, and most importantly, we need to integrate be analytical and link the work in the studio to your preferred activity. How do we use the equipment? I often hear people say the Pilates studio looks like a torture, a torture chamber, and indeed the reformer does look quite similar to the stretcher in the Tower of London. But no, it's not a torture suite. In my book, it's more of a playground. With lockdown, I've had to become a lot more creative with the use of smaller equipment like boards, bands, small weights, and general household bits. But as far as the studio equipment goes, we can use it to facilitate the correct movement pattern, or to increase load by adjusting the tension in the springs accordingly. Heavier is not always harder. We use the equipment for feedback, for, um, as the position of our body in space. And of course, we can use it to challenge ourselves, and even more importantly, have fun. The more we experiment, the better prepared we are for the unexpected. So with this, I will wrap up here, hoping that I haven't confused you too much. A holistic approach to movement is difficult to break down into set steps. But similarly, the body is not a machine. It's an organism. Every ACL rupture has some similar characteristics, but every story behind it is different. So please, if you do have any questions um, about Pilates, just drop me an email and I hope you enjoy the rest of the webinar. Thank you for listening. So I hope that that's given you some insight into the team who are around to be involved in the management of any given case. And, and for some um, scenarios, it's appropriate that everyone's involved. For other scenarios, it would be only one or two members of the multidisciplinary team as we presented it here this evening. What we've got at Pure is that we've got one of the most comprehensive sports and exercise medicine offerings um, in the UK. We understand this aspect of the fact that good physical health and well-being are essential to everyday life, and we want to ensure it's the best that it can possibly be. 
if you're struggling with knee pain, then we, we've got these treatment packages as we've talked through, but ultimately we've got a team of people there here at Pure that would look at and aim to um, have a positive impact upon your symptoms based off of the approaches really that, that I've aimed to walk through or take you through um, this evening. I hope that you found it of some interest. Um, I'm gonna pop up a final poll, which um, will allow you to be brutally honest um, in an anonymous fashion as to uh, whether you found this evening's session uh, informative at all um, and uh, whether it's helped you to understand your knee pain better if you are experiencing some knee pain. I'd um, be more than happy to open up the forum here now for, for any uh, questions and answers that you, or questions that you might have, and hopefully I'll have some answers, uh, no promises. Um, uh, but yeah, over to you. The stress factors around the, the lateral condyle, assuming that you're able to offload uh, quite a bit, would will still take somewhere between uh, two to three months to settle fully. Um, but I think now this is the this is the important thing to say around uh, stress factors. So Donnell's asking around um, stress factors, is that um, uh, it's not about taking everything away and then doing nothing. It's about finding ways in which to keep you doing something, and that being that certain something that is not painful, and then um, bringing and graduating your load exposure through that knee as is being tolerated by the tissue. So it may be that you need to offload quite a lot for the first uh, two to four weeks, but then after that period of time, that we're able to graduate your exposure. And dependent on obviously what the imaging has shown and the, the magnitude of the stress fracture, as fresh stress fractures in itself are on a continuum. Um, some are quite mild and some are really quite marked and, and are only um, just um, inches away from actually being a more substantial sort of fracture in themselves. So, um, so I'm sort of stating average tissue over average time, healing at an average rate really to you. But um, I think what's, what's important to say with that is that, uh, and this is what I often say to my athletes, it's not about pulling you back and you doing nothing. It's about finding what it is that you are able to do within your, within your level of tolerance. And from there, you build up very gradually um, over, over the course of time. I hope that's helpful. Well, if there are no more questions, then I will um, uh, bid you a good evening and let you get back to it. Uh, thanks very much for coming along. As I said, do, do reach out if there's um, anything that you'd like to ask offline. Absolutely not a problem. Great to have you all along. All right, take care. Good to see you. Bye-bye.